This is Roger, and today's topic will be delivered in two parts. First is the lead up to 1913 armory shows, and then part two, which will look more closely at the artist on display at this monumental event. Before we explore the armory show, I'd like you to consider a few things. What would you think about the event if you were there 100 years ago? What do you think about the event when you're looking at it from today? And what if you were attending the show in 1913, but you were not the prototypical target audience? What if you were non-white, not heterosexual, and you were not a man? The show, of course, was assembled by white heterosexual men, hence the question. The show took place in the 69th Regiment National Guard Armory in New York City. Burlap walls were configured to create 18 booths. Pine trees were used as a symbol of liberty and decorated the place. The layout, which you see here, included the blue areas, which were for American art, the red was for French art, the green was for Irish and English art, and the gold designated Dutch, Swiss, and a little bit more of the American art. So, why put on a show at all? Well, the goals behind the event were to show innovations in modern art to the broader U.S. populace and to promote modern art created by American artists. The organizers assembled 1,300 works by 300 artists, of which 41 were produced by women painters and sculptors. They had nearly 300,000 visitors over the three-city tour. The event took place for four weeks in New York, three weeks in Chicago, and two weeks at the Boston Copley Center. The idea behind this came from visiting the London Grafton show in 1910 and then again in 1912, as, as well as a very large event that took place in Cologne, Germany. Certain Americans were having success in Europe, such as Max Weber and Morgan Russell, but they were not enjoying the same success back in the United States. The same thing held for the artists who were the organizers, Arthur Davies, Walt Kuhn, and William Glackens. They were not seeing the success that they would like to have seen as artists, so they planned the event. Now, early collectors and artists might have been familiar with the European art scene from travel or through modernist shows at the Alfred Stieglitz Gallery 291 in New York. So, Take a second and see if you can identify which of these is the Matisse, which is the Van Gogh, which is by Constantine Brancucci, and which is by John Sloan. Two examples of Americans who had already adopted modernism are Chicagoan Meneer Dawson and Arthur Dove. Art historian J.M. Mancini has posed that modernism in America had begun developing in the 1870s and 1880s, primarily as a result of new publications covering art, new art criticism, and also via new museums that were being built. Other leading edge American enthusiasts were introduced to modern art, primarily in New York at the Stieglitz Gallery. The idea of artists collaborating to draw attention may sound familiar to those of you who attended the French Salon and Impressionist class. Monet was a highlight of the Impressionist ex exhibition. There was the Salon des Independent, where Cezanne was a star, and the Salon Autumn, where Matisse and his friends earned their initially pejorative, now acclaimed, Fauve's nickname. The eight Americans had their show in 1908, and then, as I referenced, two shows were held again at the Grafton Gallery and the Sonderbund in Cologne. 
The Grafton Show was organized around Edward Manet and filled in around him with Cezanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, and Matisse. That show returned in 1912 with more Russian art and decidedly more post-Impressionist work. The Sonderbund Cologne Show occurred at the same time as the Grafton Sale. On the right, you can see the monk lithograph in the upper corner. They were promoting quite a lot of Van Gogh and quite a few Ernst Kirchners who you will see in the lower panel also. So the question came up as I was looking at this topic, how do you borrow that amount of artwork? It turns out that Walt Kuhn, Arthur Davies, and Walter Pack were the ones that assembled the European artworks. Kuhn traveled to The Hague, which is where he decided upon the idea to promote Odeon Redon, an artist we'll spend more time on next uh, session. Then Kuhn and he visited Berlin, and next they went to Cologne, just as the German show was wrapping up. He then met up with Davies and Kuhn in Paris, where they were all able to meet artists, including Constantine Brancouche, the Duchamp Villon brothers, that's Marcel Duchamp, Jacques Villon, and Raymond Duchamp Villon. And the group also met major dealers such as Bernheim June, Drouet, and Vollard. While Kuhn finalized the deals in Paris, Davies and Pac went to London. They caught the end of the Grafton show and decided to heavily promote Matisse. They directed Kuhn to assemble more Matisses before leaving Europe. Meanwhile, in the U.S., William Glackens had been assembling the American art and also ran a selection jury to review unsolicited applications. Stuart Davis is an example of someone who got in through that process. So, how did this all come together, and what kind of press did it receive? Well, it shocked many in the press. Some just did not like the art. For others, they may have been frustrated that they could not understand some of it, so they weren't altogether negative, but they were not completely behind it because it just didn't make sense to them at the time. In front of you is a bold, voluptuous, and muscularly drawn Matisse nude staring at you. On the right, you have Mustard Pot and Woman from Picasso, which drew a lot of attention. Then you have the Gauguin, Flowers and Vase, in the middle, where he sculpted the vase as a head. Next, the nude descending the stair on the left, which we'll be talking a lot more about in the second part of this lecture. Here are some of the clips from the press. If you look at the clipping on the right, you see it says, Curing the Insane with Art. If you look more closely, you'll see Insurgent Exhibition in New York. Cubist art students are joyful in the Armory Show art battle. The photo in the middle is from the protest at the Art Institute of Chicago. They had a marching band. They burnt Henri Matisse in effigy. They called him Harry Mattress, and they burned his uh, simulated artworks. And they also painted some Cubist works of their own and brought them into the fire, too. American Mary Cassatt was from Allegheny, Pennsylvania, but had been living in Paris for many years. She exhibited with the Impressionist. This work was the most expensive offered for sale by a woman at the show. It didn't happen to sell during the event. The only work which sold near that price or for more was the Paul Cezanne purchased by the Metropolitan Museum of Art for $6,700. Edith Dimack studied at the New York Art Students League. Her work is here on the right. She was William Glacken's wife, and her watercolors sold very, very well. Earlier, we uh, spoke quite a bit about Robert Henry in Philadelphia and New York as a uh, instructor in the group that was associated with him, many of which were uh, part of what was called the Ashcan School. And here you have two of his students. Uh, on the right, you have the better known of the students at the time, which was John Sloan. 
And we saw this piece earlier in the series. It's the Sunday morning girls washing their hair. On the left, you have Stuart Davis. This is not prototypical Stuart Davis. This is Stuart Davis channeling what he learned as a student from Robert Henry. Later on, we'll see a little bit more about Stuart Davis' works. Here are two additional Americans that were on display. On the left is Edward Hopper. Yes, that Edward Hopper. This is not a typical Hopper, as most of us would notice. This is sailing from 1911, and this is during the period when he had been a student of Robert Henry. On the right is an American artist, Henry Ruderdahl, and this is the blast furnaces from 1912. He was not a student of Henry. Now, the former revolutionaries were no longer that revolutionary. Uh, of course, Claude Monet had been quite the sensation at the Impressionist shows in the years that followed. Here, he was on display, but it didn't draw quite the fanfare that it did uh, 20 years earlier. And the same goes for Pierre Renoir. Here you have a gorgeous piece in the garden. And again, these were on display. They did not sell and they were not drawing quite the attention they had in the preceding years. Post-Impressionists in the Fauves kept pushing the envelope, in which case you now see unrealistic coloration in this George Brock and in the Pointillist George Surratt piece, where in the background you can spot a little image of the Saturday afternoon a Grand Jatte on the wall. Post-Impressionists in the Fauves kept pushing the envelope, in which case you now see unrealistic coloration in this George Brock on the left, and in the Pointillist George Surratt piece on the right, where in the background you can spot an image of the Saturday afternoon at Grand Jatte, which is at the Art Institute of Chicago, on the wall. Here are a couple of peaceful pieces to look at, on the left is John Twachman in an impish Constantine Brancucci. And here are some questions to contemplate when we get ready for our call. Why did the Americans establish the show and what were their aims? Why do you think Chicago had such a large attendance? The nude descending the stairs was rejected for a show in Paris just a year before. Yet it was included in this show and received tremendous attention. Why do you think? Do you think the nude is cubist or futurist? And I know for some of you that's a trick question because we haven't talked about futurism yet, but we will. Matisse was the rave of Europe, yet they burned his work in effigy at the Art Institute. We'll talk more about that, but I'll be curious. What are your thoughts? And how do you think the American artists did in sales after they put on the big event and after two-thirds or more of the display were American pieces? Next up in part two, more on Gauguin here on the left, Picasso on the right, in modernism.